coming home. But they have to acknowledge, even to themselves, that in the midst of that, there's also a sense of penetrating hopelessness, that there is a great grief, a sadness for all that has been lost. In the midst of this time, they have had now opportunities to reflect, and there are great questions that weigh heavy on their hearts and minds on the cusp of their freedom from exile. They find themselves wondering, have they been changed by this time in exile? Will they be radically different now than they were before? Is the relationship they have with God, is that going to be different too? They come to realize in this critical transition point in their lives that they have been changed. And now they must, in many ways, reshape their very identity and reclaim who they are as children of God. I suspect in many ways that many of us today feel as though we too have been in a time of exile. The COVID virus started at the beginning of the year just drags on and on, and every time we think we're coming to the end, I don't know about you, but I think the light we see at the end of the tunnel right now is a train coming, and we better watch out. We find ourselves in the midst of a time of exile where we've had to suspend life as we have known it, where things are completely different. Hopefully we are on the end of that time, but I suspect we still have months to go before we emerge from this global pandemic. We, like the ancient Israelites, undoubtedly feel as though we have been in exile now for months, that we have suspended life as we have known it. And we, like the ancient Israelites, yearn to know that God is present to us. We yearn to know that, as the prophet said, that God would rip open the heavens and be evident to us. And just like the ancient Israelites, we're filled with a lot of questions. Will we be changed by the coronavirus pandemic? Has our relationship with God changed in some ways as well, not just for ourselves individually, but for all of us together? We may find that our very identity is being challenged and that as we move through this pandemic and move toward the other side, we may be so radically changed that who we once were before may be quite different than who we are when we come on the other side. Perhaps one of the most challenging parts of this pandemic experience is that recognition of that penetrating hopelessness. Just when we think things were going to get better, they continue to worsen. The death toll continues to climb. Those hospitalized continue to multiply. There is a penetrating hopelessness that grips not just a nation as it did long ago with the Israelites, but it is a penetrating hopelessness that grips the entire world. And then, of course, there's the challenges that life as living in human bodies brings us, and often there are the moments of hopelessness we may experience as we struggle with the illnesses and injuries that come totally aside from the virus. And we all know that there have been those that we have loved and cherished who have died that had nothing to do with the virus either. And now we approach the holidays. We've made it through Thanksgiving, and now we begin the church year with Advent. And while that may not have significance for many people, this season of Advent and Christmas is a powerful time for many people and often a challenging time as it resurfaces memories and struggles. Whether we like it or not, there is a sense of penetrating hopelessness that sometimes grips our hearts and minds. The great paradox of Advent is that it isn't just about hope, but it is hope that comes in the midst 
and against the penetrating hopelessness of life. Of life. And so we surround ourselves with many symbols that remind us that even in the midst of the penetrating hopelessness, God's hope is there for us. Perhaps making the experience of hope even richer by our awareness. The challenge of Advent is that it is a season that invites us to embrace this paradox of life, that embraces us to to acknowledge the penetrating hopelessness in our world and in our lives, counter juxtaposed to the message of hope of this season. Generally, in times past, some of what we invite ourselves to do during Advent that's a little bit different is to take some time and space for God, some time and space in prayer and reflection that empowers us to acknowledge and embrace the penetrating hopelessness and to hear the words of hope. This year, I suspect, we have a unique opportunity because we will not be surrounded by the usual activities and parties and festivities that have marked this season in the past. So we have a unique opportunity to take some time to spend time in prayer and reflection to embrace this strange paradox of penetrating hopelessness and hope. As I said earlier, we distributed and have extra copies of our devotional for Advent written by the general minister and president of the Disciples of Christ, Reverend Terry Hort Owens. She writes a reflection for each day, and we invite you to use that devotional as a way of entering the paradox of hopelessness and hope. We're also going to have opportunities for reflection and conversation around these studies. On Wednesdays, we'll have a regional opportunity at 9 in the morning. If people are morning people, they might want to join as people from around the region come together on Zoom and reflect on this devotional. For those of us who aren't quite the morning people, I'm going to be doing a study at 6 in the evening, again on Zoom and we're going to distribute that information for anyone that would like to join us. A time where we can come together and have conversation about this paradox of where we're experiencing desolate hopelessness and where are we seeing signs of hope. Of course, we will continue, as is our custom, with worship. Worship, too, will look a little bit different. We'll continue to offer in-person worship as long as we are able to given how the virus goes in our community. And we'll also be continuing to offer it virtually. We're experimenting with some new ways to do that and freshen that up a little bit as well. We send out a paper worship bulletin that includes my meditation, a little bit shorter, just in case you're worried, and some other material to help as you spend time in reflection and prayer. And of course, we will continue with some of the traditions that we are used to here at First Christian Church. We will um, have our lessons and carol service. This year, it will be on the 20th, Sunday the 20th, the fourth Sunday of Advent. And it will be a special time of scripture and music. And we will, of course, have a service Christmas Eve. So the skeleton of our faith life will look much the same as it has in many Advents before while the details within it fluctuate and change. Advent is a unique season because it does invite us to not flee from the penetrating hopelessness that we might experience in our lives as individuals and as part of a nation and world. But that penetrating hopelessness does not have the final word. All the symbols we surround ourselves remind us that even in the most penetrating hopelessness, God's light shines and brings us hope. Just as the ancient Israelites, through the prophet Isaiah, cried out to God and said, God, tear open the heavens and reveal yourself to us that we might know you are still with us. And so we come to this Advent season seeing the symbols of light, of the evergreen tree, of the advent wreath, 
We see the royal blue color before us. We see all these symbols that surround us and remind us that even in the most penetrating hopelessness, God's hope prevails. We move closer and closer each week to God's revelation in the incarnation as a small baby in a dark and dingy manger in a far away town. But it was that willingness on God's part to come into this world, to embrace fully the penetrating hopelessness that is often part of our lives that gives us hope today. So no matter how long our exile may go on, no matter how weighed down by COVID-19 and life we may feel, may we not run from that feeling, but may we embrace it knowing that the penetrating hopelessness in our lives and in our world is not the final word of God. God is in our midst, and yes, we may be changed by this experience, but God's love for us is eternal and is manifest in a small child born in a manger. Amen. <laughs>